Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hillside Community Church for Sunday morning service, March the 7th, 2021. My name is Pastor Clint Lang, and I'm really glad that you could join us today for a Sunday service. Now, we're still unable to meet in person, but we can meet over the airwaves. And I pray that this morning you would be encouraged with the word as we continue our series in the book of Second Peter. Today will be my final sermon in this series. And I would like to ask you to bow with me in prayer before we start. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. Thank you, God, that you teach us all things that we need to live a godly life. And Lord, I just pray for the people that are out there. You know the needs that are present. You know exactly the heart of each person that's tuned into this broadcast. And, and I just pray that you administer by the power of your spirit. Lord, that you'd fill my mind and my lips with your word and that I would be able to speak it in the way that you intended for them to hear it. And God, as we finish our series in this book, I pray, God, that you would just bless this word and um, that it would change hearts, would change lives, and would encourage those that need encouragement, strengthen those that need strengthening. And God, I, I praise you and I thank you for this wonderful day that we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. So, in this particular book, we've gone through a, a number of things, and, and the primary theme of it was Peter was concerned uh, that the people in the churches in Asia Minor would steer clear of the false teaching that had arisen um, that was contrary to what the apostles had originally taught in these churches. So Peter was really concerned about that. Last week, we focused on that. Now, Peter moves on to another uh, a bit of information that he wants the churches to know before he leaves. And this is his final address to the churches out there prior to his execution by the Romans. So I would just like you to uh, read along with me if you've got your Bibles. I'm going to be speaking a message that I've entitled, How Then Should We Live? And my text this morning is first, or Second Peter chapter 3. So, from verses 1 to 4, we read, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all else, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it is, has since the beginning of creation. So Peter's goal in writing this second letter to the churches was to actually stimulate the believers to wholesome th thinking so that they wouldn't be captivated by these false teachers and their teaching who were trying to correspond with them and were leading some of them into error. Peter wanted to remind the believers of the words spoken to them in the past by the Old Testament prophets and also from their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, who had spoken through the apostles, including himself. In order for right thinking patterns to be established, uh, people need to be exposed to and engage with the truth. Now, Peter is very clear that this truth can be found in the pure teachings of Jesus and in the inspired scriptures written by the true prophets of God in the past. And what teaching is Peter referring to here that will bring wholesome thinking to the believers in this passage? Peter explains that he's referring to teachings concerning the second coming of Jesus and the end of all things. Now in verse 3 he says, Above all, believers must understand that as time marches on, there will be people who will follow their own evil desires and will reject the Lord. Peter assures the believers that people would scorn, mock, and show contempt for the teachings of the apostles and the prophets saying that Jesus would come back again and that the end of the world would come. They, 
reference the fact that everything has continued the same throughout the ages and suggest that sound teachings on this subject were actually foolishness. Bible commentator William MacDonald reports that what they are saying is this. Well, you Christians have been threatening us with warnings about terrible judgment on the world. You tell us that God is going to intervene in history, punish the wicked, and eventually destroy the earth. It's all a pack of nonsense. We have nothing to fear. We can live as we please. There is no evidence that God has ever intervened in history. Why should we believe that he ever will? You see, it is latent within human nature to doubt. Even believers, left to their own devices, are prone to doubt the supernatural intervention of God. You know, even when we're praying for it, we, we can sometimes almost not believe it when God answers our prayers. Consider how in the past, the disciples themselves doubted the testimony of people concerning God working the supernatural. Look what happened when Jesus rose from the dead. And uh, witnesses of that came to tell the disciples they wouldn't believe it. In Acts chapter 12, when God miraculously released Peter from prison, he went to the house where a number of believers were staying and praying. Peter was met at the door by a little girl named Rhoda, who went and reported it to the rest of the people in the house. Now, they were praying for Peter at the time. And they wouldn't believe her. They thought she was out of her mind. They told her she was out of her mind because they thought Peter's imprisonment was an impossible circumstance and it was going to lead to his death, just as it had led to James, the brother of John's death. Now, even though they had been praying for Peter's release, when God granted their request, they actually would not believe it. How, how significant is this? It's natural for people to doubt the supernatural in, in interventions of God. What they failed to see was that God is the supernatural factor. Yes, naturally what that little girl said she was seeing was impossible, but with God all things are possible. So coming back to our text, there will inevitably be people who will have a hard time believing the teaching that Jesus will come back to the earth again. Those who do not want to submit to God or retain his knowledge because they're content for, for living their lives in evil, that they will mock the teachings of the church when we teach the, teach the truth. Some will reject the claims of the apostles, who teach, firstly, that Jesus is alive, secondly, that he is God, and thirdly, he will come back to judge the world and establish himself as king over it, and eventually... He will have the world destroyed and reformed to make a new heaven and a new earth. Peter continues, saying that God's promise of judgment over the world has happened once before when people were mocking. He continues in verse 5, saying, It happened once before, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heaven and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. God intervened significantly in the affairs of men in the past to punish wickedness. It happened once at the time of Noah's flood. It will happen again, not by water in the future, but by fire. However, mockers and skeptics will not recognize this because they are willfully ignorant, priding themselves in being knowledgeable. They claim to hold true to sound principles of scientific investigation, but ignore the geographical signs everywhere that point to the fact that there was a catastrophic flood on the earth. We don't know exactly how God formed the heavens and the earth. The fact that we cannot know what God uh, has done exactly 
it causes men to doubt. People like to have a grasp on absolutely everything. And when they come to something that is transcendent to them, like creation, they need to formulate their own theories about it because in the pride of man's heart, people cannot accept that they are not the pinnacle of understanding in the universe. They have a hard time acknowledging a higher authority than themselves. It's always when people want to follow their own pride-filled desires that they begin to scoff. It may not be outward, but man wants to be independent, to gratify himself. And as such, he longs to rid himself of God, to cut free from God's authority over himself. You know, people that follow this path in their minds, they say that the only thing that is durable and abiding is the cosmos. Where and how it began, they say nobody knows exactly. But it came and it goes on and they formulate their theories on how it happened. As for the second coming of Jesus, they look back at the prediction of this as being absurd. It is as if Peter is saying, you want to believe that there was no flood? Well, I can tell you why you say such a thing. If you admit there is a flood, then you must admit the judgment of God upon wickedness on the earth. And if you admit the judgment of God on wickedness on the earth, it is more probable that he will judge the earth again a second time, just as he did the first time. To the scoffer, the very thought of this is repugnant because the scoffer is in love with his sin and he does not want to submit to a higher authority than himself. Paul is very clear on this way of thinking as he states in Romans 8, chap chapter 8, verse 7. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. But this is the very reason why the wrath of God is going to come on the earth a second time. Romans chapter 1, 18 to 20 tells us the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from his workmanship so that men are without excuse. Paul also backs up what Peter says about the coming of the second judgment of God in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2-4. For you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and security, destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in the darkness, so that this day should overtake you like a thief. Peter assures the saints that what the apostles had taught them was true. They could stand firm in that, even though mockers mock and scoffers scoff. He reminds them that although the day of God's final judgment on the wickedness of this world is delayed, God's word to them is true, and they ought to live their lives in such a way as they are ready to meet God at any time no matter what occurs. These things will come to pass, whether or not in our lifetime or after it. Peter reminds the church that God is not bound to time and space like mortal humans. His perspective is eternal. We cannot fathom this because we operate within the parameters of the clock, but God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God, even as the heavens are higher than the earth. Peter continues in verse 8 of our text, saying to the church, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, God 
is very patient. There's a big reason why God appears to be slow in keeping his promises. Peter repeats King David's statement about God and time in Psalm 94, where God, where David said, God is eternal. And, and to him, his day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. See, we're not to judge God for his delay, as we might do with other men when they don't do what we think they should do in a timely fashion. God's perspective is eternal, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Clark's commentary on this particular passage states that all time is as nothing before him, because in the presence, as in the nature of God, all is eternity. Therefore, nothing is long, nothing is short before him. There is no lapse of ages which impairs his purposes. Spurgeon once said this, With God indeed there is neither past, present, nor future. He takes for his name I am. He is the I am. I am in the present, I am in the past, and I am in the future. Just as we say of God that he is everywhere, so we must say of him that he is always. He is everywhere in space. He is everywhere in time. There is one thing that God is always slow about, and that is judgment. He never judges until he is warned and he is given space for repentance. He is very patient with all of us. He understands the frailty of humanity in our nature, and he desires that all people of the world have the opportunity to come to repentance and be saved because of his great love for all that are in the world. God's patience in delaying the great and terrible day of his judgment on the earth means salvation for sinners who recognize their need for him. God calls out, just as he called out through the prophet Ezekiel to Israel in Ezekiel 33.11, where he says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why do you die, O people of Israel? Why will you die? But there will be mockers, and there will be scoffers who will not repent. They will continue to do their evil and and steep in their rebellious behavior right to the end, despite God's patience with them. The scoffers are wrong on two points. They fail to recognize that all things have not continued without divine intervention as they suppose. The great flood was a major intervention, bringing judgment on evil in the days of old. Secondly, they misunderstand the reason for the apparent delay in the judgment. All men who spurn the grace of the Lord will do so at their own peril. They will come to a sudden and a destructive end. Everything they thought so smugly that they controlled will be suddenly taken away from them in a flash, and they will not be able to stop and change their course. So, in misunderstanding the reason for the delay. The reason is opportunity for reconciliation with God. The Lord cries out through his word, Be reconciled to me. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. Come to the cross. Give the Lord your heart, your life, and, and you will receive salvation and eternal life in Him. The Lord is patient. In verse 10 of our text, Peter continues, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. The day of the Lord will surprise many. It will come suddenly, and it will be an awesome and a terrible day. 
There is much we could continue to say concerning these things. I could preach numerous ser sermons on this passage. But Peter's point in context with what he's trying to say here is to encourage the people to live for Jesus wholeheartedly during the time that they've been given on the earth to live. Peter wants to reinforce the truth with the disciples that have started following Christ. That the second coming of Christ and the coming end of all things will in fact take place. It will come to pass. He wants them to be mature as they look forward to the day approaching. In verse 11, Peter tells them, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live godly, holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, where the righteousness dwells. So after emphasizing the fact that the world and everything in it will be subjected to fiery judgment, Peter asks the church a rhetorical question. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? In recognition that the true king of the universe will be coming and he will be judging the earth and he will be establishing his throne here and then he will um, be reforming the heavens and the earth as his children, as children of the light. The consideration of these solemn facts should lead us to a di very different place than the rest of the world. We ought to be imitators of our Lord by living holy and godly lives, set apart for Him, bowing the knee of our hearts to Him, maintaining a complete separation from all evil. For God has purposed that His children be children of the light and be light bearers and participate with him in the unfolding of his plan. In verse 12, it appears that the Lord even uses us as we are obedient to him to speed his return. How do we as agents of the Most High God speed his coming? Well, we speed the day of the coming of God by being obedient to him in evangelism. As his children, our great commission is to spread the good news of the gospel to every nation and to every person in those nations. In Romans 11.25, Paul tells us that God's focus will return to Israel when the full number of Gentiles has come in. We don't know when that's going to happen, but we believe with the signs of the times that it is near. And we speed the coming of God by being obedient to Him in sharing with others the hope that we have found in Jesus. We speed the coming of the day of God through prayer in response to the words of Jesus in Revelation 22.20, uh, 20, which he writes, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. In response to this promise, we too, along with the other saints throughout history, can pray the prayer of Revelation 22.20, 20, which follows this promise of the Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Because the very elements will be melting in the heat, God will be reforming the heavens and the earth, promising to make all things new, as prophesied in Isaiah chapter 65.17, which says, See, I will create a new heavens and a new earth, the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. So Peter continues in verse 14 saying, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to all of this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with wisdom that God gave him. 
He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them some of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawlessness and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So Peter, Peter loves the the. The, the believers in the churches that he's writing to. You can just see his heart yearning for them to understand the calling that they've been given. He continues to emphasize holy living. You see, God has given us everything we need to live godly and holy lives. We don't have to be conformed to the pattern of this world any longer. We can be transformed by the renewing of our mind, but we must submit ourselves to be obedient to the Spirit of God as He calls us into that obedience. And since we are looking forward to the day that God is going to make everything new and the old order of things will be passed away and the receipt of an inheritance from our Lord Jesus as a reward which cannot perish, spoil, or fade, we are encouraged to live out our lives here in holy reverence for our Savior. As 1 Peter chapter 1.17 says this, Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time here as foreigners here in reverent fear. And as Peter says in our text, passage, making every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Not because we earn our salvation. No, but because we are so grateful for our salvation that our heart is filled with love for God and a passion to live for Him wholeheartedly until the day of Christ. Finally, Christians, we must sense our responsibility to continually check the content of what our teachers tell us. You see, Peter and Paul and the other apostles have taught us so many things. We must hold firmly to those things that they have taught us because those things were taught to them by the Lord Jesus Christ and they are the foundation on which the church rests with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. All teaching that we receive from any teacher including me, must be compared with and measured against the truth of God's word. Hold to what is good. Reject what is is inconsistent with the contextual teaching of God's word. The false teachers lead people astray. We must be vigilant, alert, and prayerful when we approach the word of God, when we listen to teachers. No matter how good and reasonable a teaching sounds on the surface, we must measure it with God's Word. If it does not follow sound doctrine, we must reject it. Today, for those who are listening to this message, be true to the Lord. Seek after Him wholeheartedly. Live for Him with everything that you are and everything that you have. The day of Christ is coming so soon. His coming is, is going to be any time. We could be raptured at any moment. We don't know the day nor the hour that the Lord comes, but we do know that the seasons show that it is very close. Let's live in such a way that is honorable and pleasing to God and and turn our back on the sin that so easily entangles and run the race that we have been given with perseverance in such a way as to win the prize. For those who may be listening to this message today and you cannot sincerely say 
that you've asked Jesus to be your Savior. The day of the Lord will come suddenly. It will be an awesome and a terrible day. We see this day as described in Revelation 19. You must be warned that today is the day of salvation. There may not be another day for you to to live, to turn your life over to Christ. Today could be the day that you meet your Maker. Today could be the day where the Lord comes and you are found to be left alone in this world. I don't want to to brush over this. If you if you've never given your life to Jesus, you need to give your life to Jesus. He loves you. And he, and he wants to bring you into his kingdom, his everlasting kingdom that never fades. Would you give Jesus Christ your heart today? Would you ask him to be your savior? Would you allow his spirit to cleanse you from all sin and to fill you with life anew? I pray that you would. Jesus, I thank you for each and every person that's here today listening to this broadcast. God, you know what each person needs. And for those that are are just needing to renew their first love, God, I, I just pray that by your Spirit that you would fill them with the strength and peace that comes from you. Lord, that they would they would just be passionate in serving you and passionate about living holy and godly lives as they see the day advancing, knowing full well that everything is going to end in the way that we've described today. Jesus, I pray that those that don't know you today would give their lives to you. If you're listening here to this prayer, you can ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. You can cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you. Ask Him to be your Savior and your Lord and He will not turn you away. If you believe in your heart that He is Lord, that God has raised Him from the dead, and that He is your sacrificial offering that cleanses your heart, your spirit from sin, you believe in your heart and you confess Him with your mouth, the Bible says that you will be saved. If that's you today and you've made this decision, please connect with a believer that knows Jesus Christ. Or you can call Hillside Community Church and I'd be happy to talk with you. Lord, thank you for this day, a day that you have made. We rejoice in it and are glad, O God. And I pray all of these things so that Jesus Christ may be glorified in your holy name, Lord. Amen.